evening from Tokyo and welcome to another edition of the online conversation series at the United Nations University. My name is Sabine Becker-Thierry and I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Professor Mats Berdahl. He's the Professor of Security and Development in the Department of War Studies and at King's College London. He is more specifically the Director of the Conflict Security and Development Research Group and was formerly the Director of Studies at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Welcome, Mats. Thank you very much, and uh, I should say good morning from London. <laughs> thank you for joining us early in the day, and thank you all for, for watching. Um, Mats, you are an expert on security, on development issues. You're an avid observer and researcher of wars, of peace, of peacemaking, of today's inherently interconnected world. One of your latest publications is What is this thing called peace in, in survival? And if we look at the global situation today, um, since the beginning of this year, the world has been hit by COVID-19, the greatest global challenge since World War II. At the backdrop of that pandemic, how would you describe the current state of multilateralism? Well, that is a... It's, it's an excellent question. And I, and I think um, it is important uh, when we consider the impact of, of the COVID pandemic to start with the, the reality that when the pandemic struck, um, multilateralism and multilateral institutions were already under, under considerable stress, if you like, under siege and in many ways fragile. Um, the reason for that, uh, we, we know reasonably well, um, rising nationalisms in many countries, not just the United States, but elections in Brazil, India, parts of Europe. Uh, in all these cases, uh, we saw an increased emphasis on, on transactional diplomacy um, and a declining faith and commitment, if you like, in, in multilateralism as a value in itself. And I think that is the starting point for, for discussing um, you know, the impact of, of COVID uh, uh, on, on multilateral institutions at the moment. And I think for the purpose of discussion and analysis, it is useful, I think, when we look at uh, multilateralism to, to distinguishing between two cases, if you like, for supporting uh, the multilateral cause. Or to put this differently, multilateralism really rests on two pillars. Uh, and multilateralism is most effective when these two are equally balanced or come together. I mean, the first pillar is what you might call a value-based uh, or even ideological commitment, the idea that common solutions, international cooperation is a value in its own right. It is a question of principle and not simply one of interest. And when the United Nations Secretary General calls for solidarity, as they did uh, last month, they in a way appeal to, to this, this notion of multilateralism as a value. The second pillar, if you like, of course, is what you might call a more instrumentalist or what IR scholars might call the more sort of functionalist uh, case for it. The idea that multilateral approach is required in order to address complex challenges but also in order to, to maximize global welfare goals. And as I said, when these two come together, then the effectiveness of multilateral institutions is the greatest. Now, what has happened, I think, with, with, with before the COVID, and we talked about the state of multilateralism, is that the, the, the value-based commitment to multilateralism was under severe uh, uh, challenge, most visibly, I think, uh, from the current US administration, but also from other cases. And what the pandemic has done, of course, is to raise interesting issues about that. I think that the calls for you know, greater solidarity, the work towards you know, global ceasefire, um, hasn't been all that encouraging necessarily. But yet at the same time, I think the pandemic has brought out very clearly um, the importance of cooperation uh, across borders, not just as an optional extra, but as something absolutely vital to deal with transnational threats. So the question is now, what will happen when we go forward in the balance between these two pillars? Now, the impact of COVID has been very differential if we look across the globe. For some 
states are going out of COVID or uh, uh, going through this phase with a very interventionist approach with strengthening or th this state. Um, others are observing the very opposite. How does this, you know, balance with what you just mentioned about the two principles that I, in an ideal world would balance each other out and 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 um, support the, uh, the call for multilateralism. But can this at all be said about the current situation we are in where some states are simply deeply looking internally um, trying to grapple with the with the fallout of COVID? Well I think you, you're absolutely right to 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 emphasize that the impact, uh, and that's part of the problem uh, when you deal with multilateral responses, the impact is not uniform across societies and states. It's, it's, it's quite differential, both on states, both on the international system, and indeed on institutions. As you pointed out, I think in what we might call you know, more properly functioning states, whether they are democratic or whether indeed they are authoritarian, the role of the state uh, has to some extent been strengthened. Uh, its power and its reach has increased, either through intervention in the economy, providing social and economic lifeline to citizens, but also, of course, through the strengthening of mechanisms of control. And in some ways, that is seen as a, in some countries, certainly authoritarian, a potentially sinister and disturbing development. So here is the strengthening of the state, but of course, in weak, and especially in conflict affected states where the quality of governance was already under strain, uh, the effect has been arguably the opposite. A weakening of the state seen in the vacuum, for example, often filled by armed and non-state armed groups, in the rise of, of, of and flourishing activity of transnational organized crime, in the tensions we've seen over scarce resources leading to conflict among groups, which were often pre-existing and were aggravated by tensions. And this in turn has undermined the social fabric of society. And as you will know well from your own research, there are many sort of quantitative attempts to look at these Im impacts over the past six months. For example, there has been a notable increase in, in mob violence in many places. Um, so also, of course, in the case of ongoing conflict and where the UN is involved in peace building, um, attempts at, at resolution or resolving the conflict have been undermined by purely logistical restrictions on it. But of course, perhaps very importantly, I think, is the impact on the delivery of humanitarian assistance, which in many cases is absolutely critical. And here, conflict drivers have been, in a way, uh, stimulated um, by the, by the effect, secondary effect of the pandemic. As I said, restriction of movement um, and also the competition for limited resources. And you can see this in, for example, just not to go on for too long, but tensions between host population and migrant populations. Um, for example, in, in, in Colombia, the Venezuelan refugees, or in Yemen, between Yemenis and migrants from Horn of Africa. Now, in terms of the impact of institutions and the UN in particular, we talked about some of the, the negative ones, and, and I think they are pretty obvious. There are obviously the issue of a drop in funding and resources. That is going to be a problem as countries are struggling to pay for the, the need to address the pandemic at home. There is also the problem of politicization, which has been an issue. We look at the whole history of the, uh, of the WHO and criticisms leveled against them. And I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, there has been a sharpening of, of great power rivalries and tension as a result of the handling of this. At the same time, and this comes back, of course, though, to what we said initially about the, the pillars on which multilateralism is based. This is perhaps the, you know, the source of hope, if you like, and I'm clutching at straws, you might argue. I mean, the, the pandemic has revealed, again, that there are certain issue areas where multilateralism and cooperation are a necessity for all states, uh, powerful and small and not an option. And this is, this is what I want to stress. I mean, it is, it is a, a challenge from which they cannot insulate themselves. So it's, these are issue areas like public health, the spread of infectious disease, which we talked about today, climate change and transnational organized crime. And, and just to, to hammer this home, I mean, when I stress that there isn't, there isn't necessarily a tension between these two pillars, I mean, between principle and interest, they should 
uh, reinforce one another. And we can see that now, for example, in the, in the discussion that is taking place about the, the production and future distribution on the global scale of a possible vaccine against uh, COVID. Who should get it first? Uh, and here, this, there is a real, you know, powerful argument on both, in terms of both pillars, that you should go for the vulnerable, the weak population, strengthening healthcare systems, and so on and so forth. So, so I think it's very important to, to try to merge, if you like, to some extent, these, these two, two pillars. Uh, and, and, and the UN has a role in being an advocate uh, for, for that. I mean, the need to see this as requiring a transnational approach. In an interview earlier this week, um, the SG, um, very similar to what you just um, mentioned about uh, the SG also mentioning last, last month, said whether we are tackling a pandemic or climate crisis, we need science, solidarity and decisive solutions. Now you've talked about the UN, um, how different types of uh, member states will, you know, may, may be using or benefiting from the UN and why this is also influencing the UN. But let's look a little bit also at Europe. Um, the audience, especially from Europe, will have been following the, the refugee camp saga of Moria on the Greek island of Lesbos. On the one hand, Europe is often seen as having a history of solidarity or at least of working together on, on common issues that, that concern the, the European Union. Um, of course, this had not, has not, not necessarily always been the case, but if we look at the, at the previous, um, at the more recent history, if we look at the refugee camp situation of Lesbos, we are far from, from that call for solidarity of working together. What is your observation of how multilateralism working together in Europe is, is changing in this pandemic? Uh, a, a very good question. I mean, I think the first thing to say, uh, and it's interesting, is that uh, Europe has been hit very hard by the pandemic. Um, uh, the economies uh, are, are reeling, not least in this particular country where I'm based, the United Kingdom. And naturally, there was a the immediate reaction and response of government has been trying to shore up and deal with the fallout of that. I, and I, I fully take your point about um, the discussion uh, about the response, for example, to the refugee emergency on Lesbos. And I notice in many countries, I, I just flew back uh, from Oslo. There was a very interesting and in some ways encouraging internal discussion because Norway, which is a a very affluent country, as you know, and has done very well, all things considered, in dealing with the pandemic. The government initially allowed a very, very small number of refugees into the country. They opened for about 50 admissions. And there was an outcry from segments of the population and local government that they should bring in more. And that discussion you've seen in other countries as well. What I think here, I mean, the other issue is that Brexit is also preoccupying much of the attention of the institution. But I do think that there is in Europe um, a, a stronger underlying commitment uh, to what I called the value-based importance of multilateralism. I'm not for a moment suggesting that countries do not have their own interests, that they don't think in terms of interest. And I recognize there have been real tensions in Europe as well about the rising nationalism. But I do think uh, the European Union, even throughout the pandemic, have tried to mobilize the basis for a common response uh, in a way which further down the line, once the worst of the pandemic recedes, is, is encouraging. And I think here Germany has played, in my view, a, a constructive and an important role in that. But it is a formidable challenge. And I think in many ways, Brexit has been a very major a distraction from that. I think once you get past this particular phase, um, even this country would be keen to find common solution in response to this. I'm slightly more hopeful, but at the moment there is a, it, it is a, a, a difficult period to go through. And that tension between making the case uh, for multilateral solutions is one that still has to be made. You already hinted um at a more slightly more optimistic um, outlook or opportunities that, that this pandemic has also brought to the fore. Um, 
what opportunities do you see um, for, for more multilateral approaches going forward, whether this is the EU, whether this is the UN level, or whether this is just globally speaking? Well, I think um, one should be very careful about predicting um, the direction uh, of, of, of world politics with respect to the pandemic. I mean, I think if we start, or if we take the case of the United Nations, the, there is no doubt that you know, high level politics at the UN is very, very fraught at the moment. Mm. Um, I think therefore, almost by default, uh, the UN, the Secretariat, the Secretary General, uh, must emphasize and focus on the UN's potential role as a, as a, what you might call a central service agency for member states and as an advocate for multilateralism along the lines that I have suggested. That's, I think, what they can do at that level. At the more operational level, in the field, in missions, in situations of ongoing emergency, one should try, where possible, to seize opportunity. And you would have read many publications about you know, using those opportunities. Uh, and, and there is some historical, you know, examples of, of that being the case. When you had natural disasters like the tsunami in Aceh back in 2003, or uh, where you, that was a sort of moment of truth in terms of moving forward. Now, that is perhaps something one should try to focus on locally. Uh, I think also operationally as well, more generally, the UN obviously needs to make its its response uh, to to um, to ongoing uh, uh, conflict sensitive to the fallout of the pandemic as well and how that is complicating the picture that has to be factored into the into the into the planning uh, otherwise I think um, you know looking forward I mean um, I do think one of the great political events this autumn uh, we all know is the election in 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 the United States and uh, it's certainly not for me to comment on, on the outcome of that election, but it is certainly important that whoever occupies the White House uh, can come around to the view, if you like, that some, some challenges require a multilateral approach and are not, if you like, ideologically uh, uh, fixated on that being a problem. Otherwise, I think it is going to be very difficult to move forward in some of these areas. And as you can see, we now have a debate again about climate change and so on and so forth in the context of the election. I think that is an important first one. I think in getting Brexit through this very, very drawn out process is another important step that needs to be made in order to clear the ground for reviving multilateral institutions. So there is a lot on, on the agenda. But in the meantime, I think we, both as, as, as advocates and as, as scholars can, can point to, I think, the necessity and importance of, 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 of approaching many of these core transnational issues through the multilateral lens. Um, thank you, Max. I mean, if anything, I think you're clearly underlining to all of us the importance of multilateralism in times of crisis, in times of an ideal um, balance between interests and, and, and values, and that COVID is, is one of these situations that clearly illustrates that point. Climate change is another, and, and, and we have many more examples. But I would very much like to also give an opportunity to the audience, um, many people watching us from Japan, um, the UK, and probably many other places. Um, please uh, send through your questions through the Q&A box that you see at the very bottom right of your screen. And I invite uh, my colleague Basilio Valdehuesa to join us to, to read some of the responses to us. Thank you, Sabine. I have many questions here. I'll begin with Otilia Sofron from Independent Technical College in Romania. Uh, with economies in a decline and taxes in decline as a result, will we have sufficient resources and the right economic conditions to address the big problem, problems of our time? I, th I think um, it's, it's, it's an excellent question. I, I would go back again to the point that we both made, me and Sabine, about the differential impact of COVID on different societies. I mean, some countries are much more robust, more resilient and better equipped to deal with the consequences of the uh, pandemic, including the economic one. Uh, and, and sadly, very often, where you already have pre-existing conflicts and tensions, divisions, uh, 
they are likely to be and can easily be exacerbated as a result of the, the shortage of resources. I think what we see in some cases is an attempt to mobilize resources in a way that hasn't been done before. Some of the steps taken are quite unprecedented historically. I, I mentioned this point, I made the point initially about the state intervening again in the domestic affairs of the state, throwing out all rules about economic management just to make sure uh, that, that people have a, a, a proper livelihood. So it's going to be uneven. Um, but I think, again, here, the role of multilateral institutions is to highlight that um, we all have an interest in economies, um, you know, recovering our own, obviously. Um, but we have a common interest because of the knock-on effect uh, on instability if we don't address it across the board. And I think the multilateral forums can at least provide a framework for discussing some of the issues and seeing some of them through. And I think the EU response, you know, setting up a package of measures and so on is part of that particular process. But I do agree with you, it's going to be a very, a very formidable, formidable challenge. And we have to, again, try to, to some extent, rise above our own immediate concerns, which are perfectly understandable, and see this as part of a, of a, of a wider, wider challenge. Thank you, Professor Berlo. I have another question from Richard, a PhD student at Monash University in Australia. He says the current international system has been called post-liberal. The liberal international system meant a limited role of the state in development. Do you agree that we are in a post-liberal era? And what does that mean? Um, what does the ongoing pandemic mean for the state uh, itself after the post, after the pandemic? Another very good question, um, and, and very interesting that you should um, raise the issue of what of, of post-liberal. I mean, you could see that in two ways. One is a sense in which looking at the role of the economy, or the state in the economy, which I already have alluded to to some extent, some of the sort of traditional precepts, liberal policies, you would argue, have been you know, set aside in the interest of addressing this particular pandemic. Uh, and, 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 and that's going to be a, a continuing challenge, I think, to deal with the effects of the economy. And you'll see a more active role for the state in the economy. So that, that, I think, is going to, to, to change. But, of course, there is a question of post-liberal and, and the other aspect in understanding of liberal and, and the threat to individual liberties and the ability of the individual to flourish and work within the state. And as I hinted at initially, there is some concern that particularly certain authoritarian states are taking advantage of the increased power and reach of the state afforded by the response to the pandemic to, to tighten their control and the grip of populations. And that, that I think, is potentially a, a very worrying one. And you see that discussion in all countries. I and mean, even in, in, I believe, some of the European countries, you know, initial um, attempts to trace and track through using sophisticated apps have been sort of rejected because there are threats to, you know, a people's... Um, right to privacy and so on and so forth. In other countries, that has been less of an issue, but that is going to be a very, very interesting uh, a trend. I mean, make sure that particularly authoritarian instincts aren't reinforced by, the, by these particular trends. So in many ways, you're raising a very good question about the, about the post uh, sort of liberal order. The other thing I suppose in terms of economics is the opening up of borders again for for movement and and trade at some future stage um and in some form and the mechanism of that and we are so used to and i remember being a student in the 90s or working on this in the 90s that the world is essentially becoming more like a global village and we can travel around um for obvious reasons that has been restricted by the by the uh, epidemic what will now happen when we return to something like a, a traditional order what other restrictions are going to be in place that speaks to the wider sort of liberal international uh, uh, order. Thank you. Following that, uh, I think a good question is from Hanako Traven from Keio University. Do you think the need for medical supplies and products through uh, the need to so, uh, pass medical supplies and products through global value chains have the potential to encourage further multilateralism and co cooperation? Uh, I, I think um, I'm not myself um, an expert by any means on health systems, but I do think that one source of, of potential encouragement certainly was mentioned initially, 
uh, in responding to the pandemic was on the, the search uh, for a vaccine on the research side. Uh, that people have been, I'm leaving aside now the question of production, distribution, who gets it first, but certainly on the research side, there has been a great deal, obviously, of openness across borders, across research communities to try to find solutions as quickly as possible. Some of it facilitated by quite an impressive outfit uh, based in Oslo that tries to coordinate efforts internationally to obtain a vaccine. So that is a sense uh, uh, en en encouraging and, and I think some steps uh, are being taken there uh, and certainly a lot of push that we should try to make sure that um, obstacles, regulatory and otherwise, are not in the way of, of a rapid response to it. Um, and, and of course, there are, there are precedents for this, I think, earlier in terms of, of health cooperation. Uh, you remember the development of retroviral drugs to deal with AIDS, for example, or the patent for that, where that could be produced and where that could be uh, distributed. That also you know, led to a push for opening up uh, so that it could be distributed more quickly. So there is some, some scope there. And I think I can only assume that given the scale of disruption, social and economic in many countries, that people would want to uh, uh, encourage that kind of cooperation suggested by the question again on both grounds when i say both grounds in terms of solidarity and human decency but also in terms of that is the right forward to deal with the pandemic itself so that might be one of the areas where there are windows for for opportunity and i do think it also in terms of research communities it comes naturally or should come naturally to researchers uh, we live in the sort of we, we do have a cosmopolitan approach to to thinking and working that this should be something shared across borders Thank you. David Malone at the UNU is asking, the EU seems to be pulling itself together, even at the United Kingdom. Can it do even better than that, becoming a major force in international relations? I think it's a great question because I think a lot of people will, will just think of the EU in terms of, um, you know, this has been a sort of uh, cataract of, of, of disasters over the last couple of years. And in many ways, once we get past, and I know that's a big, big thing to get past, the, the, the turbulence, uh, the distraction created around, around Brexit, um, and we have to get through it, uh, I'm, at least sometimes, I'm, I'm impressed by the, the resilience within Europe to the commitment to a, a, a wider sense of, of, of community and a concern that um, uh, we have to preserve what we have built up. And I'm not thinking simply of the economic integration, but the political commitment. And I do think that um, sometimes, if I may be allowed to say that, I mean, the strength of the EU position sometimes in, in negotiations, uh, when sometimes people saying they should be more flexible, actually reflect this deep commitment to what has been achieved and holding on to that. And when they talk about the integrity of, if you like, uh, the internal market. It's not just in a narrow economic sense, but to the, the political progress that has been made over a long period of time. And I also think there have been some initiatives. Again, I don't want to overdo the fact and say that there aren't interests involved by individual states, but there has been some sense that we can use this as an opportunity to build as a stronger uh, institutional actor in world affairs and a force for good using both, particularly the soft power that we do have. So I. I'm in some ways slightly more optimistic um, about, about the potential, but it does require coming through a very difficult um, a period at the moment. I think we have time for one more or, yes, okay, good, Go <laughs> wonderful. Um, some arguments were made that the expectations of international organizations were not met during this pandemic. What do you think in that regard? Um, is there any inbuilt inability with international organizations to address special situations like this? It's uh, Mohammed Iftekar Mahmoud from the Eastern University in Bangladesh. Well, thank you very much for, 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 for that question. I think in assessing the performance of institutions in response to the pandemic and indeed of the United Nations, we do have to uh, always remind ourselves and ask ourselves what kind of institution we are dealing with. Uh, we are talking mostly here about membership institutions. Um, we're not talking about supranational bodies um, that act as rational actors and can respond in a calculated way to an emergency. 
ultimately, this means that intergovernmentalism and politics are very powerful forces in driving the response. So I think any assessment has to be measured against that. Having said that, that doesn't absolve them of criticism um, in terms of individual uh, responses and actions. Uh, and, I, and I think where I do think, uh, I mean, the Secretary General, had, I think, has done the absolutely right thing in terms of emphasizing, I think he has done at any rate, this thing about not just solidarity for its own sake, um, but also that that is the sensible way to go forward in terms of dealing with the long-term effects of the pandemic as well. Um, otherwise, if people go down their own individual routes, tailor their own response and look for you know, state solutions, it is likely to exacerbate ongoing conflicts. So I think that advocacy is always very important. But given the state of world politics, I'm afraid that a um, lot of this kind of work has to be done on the operational uh, level. I mean, in the field, you have to look for opportunities that have to be seized and addressed. Um, and I think it behoves us to try to, to again point out to the importance of, of, of supporting uh, 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 transnational responses to many of, many of these. But, but realize and be honest about the, the fact that um, we live in a world of, 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 of sovereign states um, um, which have agendas, interests, policies and views of their own. Uh, and that they will often tend to, to, to struggle to, to assert those. Um, so there is a, there is a fight uh, to be had about, about the right approach forward. Um, Mats, thank, thank you very much. I think this was um, a, an excellent uh, sentence um, and painting, you know, an, a positive outlook, yet stressing the complexities that this pandemic and, and other crises such as the climate change uh, crisis are reminding us on a, these days on a, da on a daily basis. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you all uh, in Tokyo, in Europe, in Bangladesh, uh, Australia, and, and, and everywhere. Please join us again. We have roughly one event per month these days. And you can also follow us online on Facebook and Twitter under hashtag uh, your new talks. Thank you and good evening. Thank you. Thank you.